Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Dr. Rose, Assistant Professor, Department of Anatomy, Government Medical College, Trishu. In this session, we will be dealing with the development of embryo from 4th week to 8th week of intrauterine period and this is actually part 2. So before viewing this file, uh, you please go through the session uh, part 1 of the development of embryo from 4th week to 8th week of intrauterine period. Now uh, let's have a look at the derivatives of ectoderm. Ectoderm is the topmost layer and this is actually getting differentiated into mainly two parts. One is known as the surface ectoderm. You can see the light blue colored area as you look from above after removing the amniotic membrane. So this light colored area is known as surface ectoderm and in the middle, somewhat in the middle uh, and on either side of the midline, you can see a dark blue colored compared to this light blue. So this region is known as neurectoderm. So this is known as neurectoderm. This is how the entire ectoderm is differentiated into two parts, surface ectoderm and neurectoderm. So let us see what are the derivatives of surface ectoderm. Surface ectoderm is actually giving rise to uh, the epidermis, hair, nails, sebaceous and sweat glands because this is actually forming a protective covering of the embryo. So all those structures which aids in the protection of the embryo will be derived from the surface ectoderm. So once again the epidermis of the skin, the hair, the nails, sebaceous glands, sweat glands all are said to be derivatives of ectoderm. And in the ectoderm as you just trace the ectoderm, in this region you can see a dip. This dip is known as stomodium. Stomodium is actually giving rise to the future oral cavity. So this stomodium, so this dip can be considered as primitive oral cavity. So let us see what are the boundaries of this uh, stomodium. So the boundaries of the stomodium above in this region you have the formation of forebrain vesicle. So above you have the forebrain vesicle. Now below you can see the pericardial swelling which is actually giving rise to the future heart position. So below you have the pericardial swelling and what do you get on the floor? This is actually the floor of the stomodium. If you consider this as a pit known as stomodium, you have above, you have some structures below and you have some structures at the floor. Above you have the forebrain vesicle, below you have the pericardial swelling and the floor, this is actually known as buccopharyngeal membrane. You can see that this is the gut tube, we will be discussing it right now. So this gut tube is actually uh, closed by a membrane known as buccopharyngeal membrane. So this stomodium is actually giving rise to the oral cavity. So only if this buccopharyngeal membrane ruptures, the communication can be maintained between the oral cavity and the gut tube. So this buccopharyngeal membrane will be rupturing in future so that uh, there, will be, there will be a communication between the oral cavity which is uh, actually formed from the stomodium and the primitive gut tube. So this floor is actually formed by the buccopharyngeal membrane. As you uh, have a closer look at this buccopharyngeal membrane, you can see that it is just formed by only two layers. One is the ectodermal layer and the other one is the endodermal layer of the gut. So there is no intervening mesoderm. You get only two layers at the buccopharyngeal membrane. One is the ectodermal layer and the other one is the endodermal layer of the primitive gut. So there is no intervening intraembryonic mesoderm at this region. That is the importance of the buccopharyngeal membrane. So as this membrane goes off, the communication is maintained between the oral cavity and the primitive gut. Now uh, in the fourth week the primitive gut will be communicating with the oral cavity by the rupture of the buccopharyngeal membrane. 
So why you want a perforation for the buccopharyngeal membrane during the fourth week of intrauterine period? Uh, the reason is you have the amniotic cavity surrounding the uh, embryo. The amniotic cavity is having nourishing fluid. So if this buccopharyngeal membrane ruptures, what will happen? The fetus will be able to swallow the amniotic fluid and the amniotic fluid will be entering into the gut tube. So till now the placenta is yet getting established. So the nourishment should be provided from some other sources as well. So the amniotic fluid as the buccopharyngeal membrane ruptures, the amniotic fluid will be gaining access into the primitive gut and this will helps, uh, this will help in the nourishment of the primitive gut. Now a similar region uh, is seen at the caudal end similar to the stomodium. This region is known as proctodium or ectodermal cloaca. So what are the boundaries of the proctodium? Similar to stomodium, let us discuss the boundaries of the proctodium. This is known as the floor. This is known as the floor of the proctodium and this floor again similar to the buccopharyngeal membrane here, you can see or you can visualize another membrane. This is known as the cloacal membrane. So this is the buccopharyngeal membrane and this is the cloacal membrane. Again when you have a look at the cloacal membrane you can see that only there are two layers. One is the ectoderm which is actually continuous with the outer surface and this one is actually the endoderm which is a part of the primitive gut tube. So there is no intervening mesoderm at the cloacal region as well. So the floor is actually formed by the cloacal membrane. So this cloacal membrane will be actually divided into two parts. One is known as the anal membrane which is posteriorly and the other one is known as urogenital membrane. Actually when this anal membrane ruptures, this will be communicating with the exterior through anal orifice and when the urogenital membrane ruptures, the bladder and the genital structures will be communicating with exterior through the urogenital orifices. So the entire membrane is known as the cloacal membrane which is nothing but uh, two layers fused together that is the ectoderm and endoderm without any intervening intraembryonic mesoderm and this is actually divided into anal membrane and urogenital membrane. When the anal membrane ruptures this anal canal is actually continuous with the exterior through the anal orifice and when the urogenital membrane ruptures, the urogenital structures will be continuous with the exterior through the urogenital orifices. Now let us see what is happening to the new ectoderm. We just mentioned about the surface ectoderm which is a modification of the ectoderm. Now what do you mean by new ectoderm? New ectoderm is actually a thickening of the ectoderm overlying the notochord. So uh, at this point uh, again I would like you to concentrate on the ectodermal layer. We are just mentioning about the derivatives of the ectoderm. Just beneath that you have the mesoderm where you get the formation of notochord. You can just uh, see a shadow in the midline. This is actually the notochord. This is not in the ectodermal layer, this is in the mesodermal layer. So the notochord is just lying under the neurectodermal layer. So you have ectodermal layer, you have the mesodermal layer, you have the endodermal layer. So ectoderm is further differentiated into a surface ectoderm and neurectoderm. Where will you get the neurectoderm? In the mesoderm you have in the center the notochordal plate or the not definitive notochord. Above the notochord the ectoderm is actually specialized to form the neurectoderm. So the thickening of the ectoderm over the notochord that is known as neural plate or neurectoderm. Now have you heard about the term known as neurulation? What do you mean by neurulation? Neurulation means it is the process of formation of neural tube and its derivatives from this neurectoderm or neural plate. So the future neural tube and the derivatives are derived from this part of the ectoderm that is neurectoderm and this process is known as neurulation. Since the notochord is actually giving rise to or uh, giving rise to the formation or differentiation of the neurectoderm, this notochord can be considered as the primary inducer. 
So, this notochord is actually giving rise to the derivatives of neurectoderm. Since it is inducing the formation of the derivatives, this notochord is considered as the primary inducer. So, let us see how this plate like thing is forming into tube and future central nervous system. So, first you have the neural groove developed in the midline of the neurectodermal plate. So, presently this is actually just a flat plate. Now, what happens is in the midline you uh, will be seeing a groove developing that is known as neural groove. So, as this uh, region gets depressed on either side what will you be getting? You will be getting elevation on either side of the neural plate. You just imagine a paper like this. If you just get a depression in the middle, you will be getting elevations on either side. So, that is what is going to happen in the neurectodermal plate. And this development of neural tube uh, occurs before the folding of the embryonic disc. Only after the forming, uh, formation of the neural tube, uh, the embryo will be folding at the craniocaudal and the lateral ends. So, before the folding, uh, the neural tube formation should be uh, complete. So, this is again a schematic representation. Here you have the uh, notochord and here you have the neurectoderm. In the midline, you can see a groove. This is known as neural groove. So, you have the notochord just lying below it. This notochord will be actually inducing the formation of neural plate in the ectoderm and once the plate is formed in the midline again a groove is formed that is known as neural groove. As the neural groove is formed on either side of the neural groove what you will be getting will be the neural folds and later these two lateral folds this is actually shown as dark blue color these two folds will come closer and will uh, fuse the ends of the neural groove so that we can see that this neural groove is now made into a neural tube and this got detached from the surface ectoderm and will be now lying closer to the notochord within the mesoderm. So, previously it was a part of ectoderm after the formation of neural groove uh, you can see that as the development progresses the neural groove will be deepening and the lateral folds the ends of the neural groove will be touching each other and finally this groove will be converted into a tube. Once the tube is formed the entire tube from this end to this end will be getting separated from the ectodermal region and this gap will be actually filled by the ectodermal cells. So, you can see that if you, this is actually a cut section you can see that the neural tube is lying separated from the ectoderm but still you can see some of the cells between the neural tube and the ectoderm that is actually a group of cells derived from these folds. These folds though they come closer and uh, fuses the neural groove into neural tube they are not actually getting incorporated into the neural tube. They are actually lying separately between the ectoderm and endoderm uh, and, and the neural tube as the neural tube gets separated from the surface ectoderm. So, the group of cells uh, which, is which are lying between the neural tube and the ectoderm you call it as neural crest cells. So, this is actually a group of cells lying on either side of the neural tube but away from the ectoderm that is in between the ectoderm and the neural tube they are known as the neural crest cells. So, this is again a schematic representation you have the formation of neural groove here you have the notochord and at the ends of the neural groove you have the folds which are giving rise to the neural crest cells. You can you just focus on this region this is actually the lateral folds as the neural tube is formed the lateral folds will be actually separated from the ectoderm but it will not be incorporated into the neural tube. And later they will be separated and they will be lying as two different swellings on either side of the neural tube. So, this is notochord you can see the formation of neural tube and on either side of the neural tube you can see the formation of neural crest. So, the thickening of ectoderm that is the lateral ends of the neural plate will be forming the neural folds. The fusion of neural folds will be actually giving rise to the formation of neural tube. 
but as a neural tube is formed the ends of the uh, folds will be actually forming as a separate mass which will be giving rise to neural crest cells. And actually this fusion, fusion of the neural groove into neural tube is not all of a sudden process. It starts at the cervical region that is at the uh, region of neck and later it will extend cranially and caudally. So it is not like you have a groove like this and it is just closed as a tube. It is not happening like that. It starts from the cervical region, later it goes towards the cranial as well as towards the caudal region. That is how it is getting fused. So uh, the non-fused region, in the process of fusing there are regions at the cranial end and caud caudal end which are not fused. So the non-fused regions are known as anterior neuropore and posterior neuropore. So at the cephalic region you call this as anterior neuropore and at the caudal region you call it as posterior neuropore. And uh, why you get the neuropores? This is not get, why this is not getting closed all of a sudden? This neuropore will actually take the amniotic cavity through the neural tube in order to nourish the neural tube. So imagine if this uh, neural uh, tube is closed all of a sudden, the amniotic fluid won't be able to enter into the neural tube. So in order to maintain nutrition for the developing embryo, the two ends of the tubes are actually uh, kept open so that the amniotic fluid will be entering through the neuropores and nourishing the neural tube. So once this amniotic fluid is used up by the embryo, now it is time to close the two ends. That is when the anterior and posterior neuropores will be closing in future. So you can see that the closure, uh, this is the neural groove. This was our neural plate which is forming the neural groove. Now the fusion has started. Uh, it started in the uh, cervical region. Now it will be moving cranially as well as caudally. So the two op uh, ends which are open, you call it as anterior neuropore and the other one is known as posterior neuropore. So this is actually the cut end of the amniotic membrane and this is actually how you view from above. So this when you look from above the periphery is actually the cut end of the amniotic membrane. You have the two neuropores, the anterior neuropore and posterior neuropore. So the amniotic fluid is actually passing through the neuropores in order to nourish the neural tube. Once the amniotic fluid is used up by the embryo, now then uh, the neuropores will be closed at both ends. So when you are anticipating the closure of the anterior neuropore. So the anterior neuropore usually closes by 25th day that is 20 somite stage because you usually uh, divide the embryonic period into somite period, pre-somite, somite and post-somite. So at the 20 somite stage you will be getting the fusion or the closure of the anterior neuropore or roughly we can say that 25th day of intrauterine period and again if you want to put it into weeks it is roughly in the middle of the fourth week of intrauterine period. So this is the anterior neuropore. Now when will this end close? This is known as posterior neuropore. The posterior neuropore will be actually closing on 28th day of intrauterine period. 28th day actually corresponds to 25 somite stage. That means 25 somites will be formed on the 28th day of intrauterine period. If you want to put it into weeks, it will be roughly corresponding to the end of fourth week of intrauterine period. So that is when you get the closure of the posterior neuropore. Now what are the derivatives of the entire neural tube? As you look at the neural tube from the cranial end to the caudal end, what are the derivatives of the neural tube? So cranial end will be giving rise to the future brain whereas the caudal end, so cranial end, this will be actually giving rise to brain vesicles and the future brain and this caudal end will be like a tail and that will be giving rise to the formation of spinal cord. And the space between the neural tube and the surface ectoderm, we have already mentioned or we have seen the formation of neural crest cells from the neural folds. Now this is the anterior neuropore, this is the posterior neuropore and you can see that it is actually getting fused along the midline. So what are the derivatives of neural crest cells? We can, we have already seen all these things. Once again this is the neural groove, uh, these are the lateral folds which are giving rise to the neural crest cells, this is an autocord. Again you can see the two groups of cells lying 
on either side of the notochord, they are the neural crest cells. So, how will you explain the position of the neural crest cells? They are actually seen dorsolateral to the neural tube, dorsolateral to the neural tube. So, are they lying like this throughout the life? No. As soon as it is formed, it will be migrating to different regions of the body according to the structure uh, which, uh, which it will be giving rise to. So, these neural crest cells, though they are lying initially on the dorsolateral aspect of the neural tube, it will be just migrating to different parts of the body according to the structures formed from it. So, what are the derivatives of the neural crest cells? It is forming the Schwann cells of the neuron, then you have the cells of adrenal medulla, it is not the adrenal cortex, it is the adrenal medulla formed from the neural crest cells. Then the ganglia, almost all the ganglia that is the neurons of the autonomic ganglia, cells of the dorsal root ganglia, then sensory ganglia of the cranial nerves like 5, 7, 8, 9 and 10, then chromaffin tissue, the pigment cells of the skin, uh, the meningeal layers of the forebrain, in thyroid gland especially the C cells of the thyroid gland are derived from the neural crest cells and the odontoblast. So, these are a set of structures which are derived from the neural crest cells among which you should know the difference in adrenal gland that is the adrenal medulla is having a neural crest origin. Then uh, you have to focus on the C cells of the thyroid gland. These are the favorite questions which are usually asked. So, adrenal in adrenal gland the adrenal medulla is derived from the neural crest cells and in the thyroid gland the C cells are derived from the neural crest cells. So, we just mentioned about the derivatives of mesoderm and the derivatives of ectoderm like uh, the surface ectoderm we completed, the neural ectoderm actually giving rise to the neural tube. So, in a nutshell if you want to put it the derivatives of ectoderm as a whole, we have seen that the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the ganglia, uh, the sensory epithelium of ear, nose and eye, then the epidermis of skin, the hair and nails, then the glands, the subcutaneous glands, the mammary glands, the pituitary, sebaceous, sweat glands, all sort of glands, the muscles of the iris and erector pili, the rest of the muscles we have uh, discussed it under the, uh, under the derivatives of mesoderm. So, the muscles of iris and erector pili, again this exception you should always keep in mind because these are derived from ectoderm whereas the rest of the muscles are of the body are derived from the mesoderm. So, all these are derivatives of ectoderm in a nutshell. Now, let us see the folding of the embryo. So, before moving on to the folding of the embryo, if you just consider uh, it is a single plate, you can see that this is the lengthwise and this is the breadthwise alignment. If you get a folding lengthwise, that means uh, from the cephalic to caudal end, you call it as cephalocaudal folding. If this is actually folding breadthwise, that means this is folding at the lateral ends and you call it as lateral folding. So, there are mainly two foldings for the embryo, the head and tail ends folds that is known as cephalocaudal folding and this is actually due to the longitudinal growth of the central nervous system. You, we just discussed about the formation of the neural tube along the length of the uh, developing embryo. So, at two ends these will be folding and that is actually giving rise to the cephalocaudal folding. And when will you get the lateral folding of the embryo? Why this embryo is not lying as a flat plate? This is actually due to the rapidly growing somites. So, the somites formation and the development will be actually giving rise to the lateral folding. So, if you consider this as a long plate, you can see that the cephalocaudal folding will be like this and along the breadthwise direction you have the lateral folding and ultimately the entire thing will be in the form of a tube. So, this is the cephalocaudal folding, this is the lateral folding. So, the one interesting factor which you would like to see here is initially uh, the precordial plate was lying between the cranial end and the gut tube. But after the cephalocaudal folding, this will be actually coming to the ventral aspect. The stomodium will be actually coming closer to the ventral aspect. And what is happening at the lateral folding? You can see that this is the amniotic cavity. So, this amniotic cavity is actually becoming bigger and bigger and this will be actually wrapping the whole uh, developing embryo and this will try to come closer to the yolk sac. This is actually what is happening in the lateral folding. So, all the folds will ultimately 
converge on the ventral aspect of the embryo that is the uh, main role of folding all the folds will be actually uh, coming and folding at the ventral aspect of the embryo so the amniotic membrane will be now lining the uh, or covering the umbilical stalk which will be later on getting converted as the uh, umbilical cord so you have the connecting stalk here the amniotic membrane uh, when the amniotic cavity is expanding laterally the amniotic membrane will now lie uh, closer to the connecting stalk and it will wrap the connecting stalk to form the umbilical cord. Now the yellow colored thing was the yolk sac. Previously the yolk sac was a big bigger thing a large sac. Now as the folding occurs the yolk sac will be actually constricted into in the form of an hourglass. So this hourglass yolk sac is formed due to the lateral folding of the embryo. Now uh, we will see about the yolk sac in details yolk sac is actually enclosed within the embryo that is the entire yolk sac uh, which was there lying below the endoderm after folding a part of it will be incorporated into the embryo the part of the yolk sac just concentrate on the yellow colored thing a part of the yolk sac will now be seen inside the embryo this is known as the primitive gut or this part of the yolk sac which is getting incorporated within the embryo as a result of folding that is known as the primitive gut and what happens to the yolk sac which is remaining outside that is known as the umbilical vesicle or the definitive yolk sac so this is actually what is happening for the yolk sac so the yolk sac in the initial period was a larger cavity as the embryo gets folded a part of the yolk sac will be absorbed into the embryo proper so what happens this part which is absorbed within the embryo proper will be giving rise to the formation of primitive gut and its derivatives but still the entire yolk sac was not able to go inside the uh, embryo proper so the part which was lying outside that will be giving rise to the umbilical vesicle or the definitive yolk sac so this part is known as the umbilical vesicle or definitive yolk sac the part within the embryo this is known as the primitive gut so what are the derivatives of primitive gut primitive gut actually gives rise to the entire gastrointestinal system and uh, the gut the primitive gut uh, the yolk sac is not actually uh, divided into two parts still it is having or maintaining communication that is the primitive gut within the embryo as well as the umbilical uh, vesicle is maintaining a communication uh, between the two structures so cranial to this communication this is the communication between the umbilical vesicle outside and the primitive gut so cranial to this communication uh, the primitive gut is forming the foregut so where will you get the foregut you have a communication maintained between the primitive gut and the part of the yolk sac which is lying outside that is the umbilical vesicle cranial to this communication the primitive gut is actually forming the foregut and what is the region uh, caudal to the communication giving rise to so this is the this is the communication so caudal to the communication it is giving rise to hindgut so between the foregut and hindgut you have a region which is actually communicating with the umbilical vesicle so this communication is uh, uh, the part which is lying between the foregut and hindgut is known as midgut later what happens is the communication between the primitive gut and the umbilical vesicle which is lying outside becomes narrower and narrower and it will ultimately result in the formation of a very thin duct that duct is known as vitello intestinal duct and this duct is actually passing through the umbilical cord so the initial period of the umbilical if you take a section from the umbilical cord in the initial part of development you will be getting a part of this uh, vitello vitello intestinal duct as well but later in course of time this will just disappear eventually so uh, the differentiation of endoderm till now we discussed about the differentiation of mesoderm differentiation of ectoderm now we will see what are the derivatives of endoderm so the derivatives of endoderm mainly the gut has got three parts as we have discussed right now the primitive gut is giving rise to foregut midgut hindgut so what are the derivatives of foregut the derivatives of foregut starts from the epithelial lining uh, of the tongue up to the ampulla of waiter 
ampulla fator which is usually seen in the second part of duodenum so from the uh, epithelial lining of the tongue up to the ampulla of fator you have the derivatives of endoderm and uh, the epithelial line apart from the git it is also giving rise to the epithelial lining of the respiratory system the auditory tube the tympanic cavity all these are derived from the endoderm and we also get the parenchyma of the glands the tonsil the thymus the thyroid parathyroid pancreas and liver all these are derived from the uh, endoderm especially the foregut region now what are the re, uh, structures derived from the midgut of the primitive gut midgut actually starts from the second part of duodenum that is exactly from the ampulla of fator up to a region that is this is the transverse colon this is actually during the course of development this will be coming down in adults so this is the transverse colon so the junction of right two third and left one third so roughly some somewhere here up to this point you have the midgut so starting from the ampulla of fator which is in the second part of duodenum up to a point that means the junction of right 2/3 and left 1/3 of the transverse colon you get the midgut formed so all the structures within this region are derived from the midgut and sometimes the vitelo intestinal duct we have already mentioned that it is the duct which communicates between the primitive gut which is incorporated into the embryo and the umbilical vesicle which was lying outside in course of time this vitelo intestinal duct will be just disappearing sometimes this will persist and that is known as meckel's diverticulum so meckel's diverticulum is persistent vitelo intestinal duct now what are the derivatives of hindgut so the derivatives of hindgut starts from the junction of right 2/3 and left 1/3 and till the pectinate line of anal canal so that is the extent of the hindgut so the junction of right 2/3 and left 1/3 of transverse colon from that point onwards up to the pectinate line of the anal canal you get the hindgut formed the mucus apart from this uh, high, uh, the structures other structures derived from the hindgut are the mucus membrane of the urinary bladder urethra and its associated glands so all these structures are derived from the hindgut region uh, and uh, epithelial lining of vagina you can also add that to the derivatives of hindgut now we will see some of the neural tube defects some of the commonest neural tube defects this is actually uh, the opening case of the session that is anencephaly anencephaly means failure of closure of the neural tube in the cranial region actually the brain fails to develop if the anterior neuropore is not closing uh, if this is diagnosed prenatally we can terminate the pregnancy instead of giving rise to an anomalous baby this is actually this actually can be prevented almost uh, most of the neural tube defects can be prevented if that lady is taking a uh, folic acid daily uh, ideally 3 months before conception and throughout the pregnancy so folic acid can be considered as a major drug which prevents the formation of neural tube defects another uh, commonest neural tube defect is spina bifida what do you mean by spina bifida it is the failure of closure of neural tube anywhere from the cervical region to the caudal region so anywhere if the neural tube fails to close you call that condition as spina bifida and this is more commonly seen in the lumbosacral region so lumbosacral region is the favorite site of formation of spina bifida there are mainly three types of spina bifida one is first one is spina bifida occulta occulta the word meaning is hidden so the first pattern or the first type is known as spina bifida occulta here what happens is this is actually the vertebra uh, this is actually a closed vertebral canal sometimes the vertebral canal won't be closed the vertebra won't be closed completely but still the spinal cord won't be coming outside through the defect the spinal cord will be still remaining within the vertebral canal though the vertebra is not closed completely so this condition is known as spina bifida occulta but at that region you can see the spine is not properly formed in this region at that region there will be a dimple over the skin with a tuft of hair that is how you suspect a spina bifida occulta 
the spine won't be formed properly there but the spinal cord won't be coming outside but uh, on the skin you can identify it as a dimple with a tuft of hair it is actually not associated with increased alpha fetoprotein because usually in most of the neural tube defects you will be getting raised levels of alpha fetoprotein but in this case you are not getting uh, an increased level of alpha fetoprotein so this is a defect in the vertebra and you can see that there is a dimple with a tuft of hair in it now the next type is known as meningocele meningocele means uh, through the defect the meningeal layer will be herniating outside so there is a defect defective closure of the vertebra through that defect the mening the meningeal layer alone is coming outside the meninges will be herniating between the vertebra so here again the nervous system remains intact and this is actually a least common variety now uh, another variety is known as myelo meningocele what do you mean by myelo meningocele myelo meningocele is actually associated with severe complications why because through the defect apart from the meninges the spinal cord also protrudes out that is why it is known as myelo meningocele meningo means meninges myelo means the spinal cord so along with the meninges you can see in this diagram that along with the meninges the spinal cord is also protruding through the defect in the vertebra now another variety is known as myeloschisis myeloschisis is said to be the most severe form of myelomeningocele here actually the nervous tissue here uh, in myelomeningocele you can see the nervous tissue uh, which is closed by the meninges that is closed by the membrane but in myeloschisis the entire uh, new nervous system the nervous tissue will be lying outside without even uh, getting covered by a membrane so myeloschisis is actually said to be a severe form of myelomeningocele so to summarize this session we have uh, seen the three different germ layers the differentiation of three different germ layers that is the derivatives of the ectoderm the derivatives of the mesoderm derivatives of the endoderm and uh, the major thing which is happening during this period is the formation of somites how uh, the age of the embryo is referred with respect to the formation of somites and we have seen the formation of folds the cephalocaudal folding and the lateral folding how the cavities are formed uh, with the help of the folding uh, then we have seen the applied aspects mainly the neural tube defects occurring in this period that is uh, the end of 4th uh, to 8th week of intrauterine period thank you